I, I would hope that most people here um, rec recognize the names of the people who are going to be um, speaking. Are they? Yeah. Patrick, Damon, Gene, John. Um, uh, yeah, whatever. I'm not even going to give too much uh, introduction. Um, they're going to talk lo uh, a lot about um, this uh, this DevOps thing and um, some uh, some foundations, some fundamentals. Um, anyway, please give a warm welcome uh, to the, to this gang of four. My name is Gene Kim. Um, you know, one of my areas of passion for the last 15 years has been studying a group of uh, organizations that we used to call geniuses of people with great kung fu. So uh, this is back when I was the CEO of Tripwire, and these are people who, you know, led organizations that kicked ass. And I think, kind of looking back, what made this uh, list of uh, people very different was that they were all boundary spanners. Uh, and so what, that boundary span, not only were they boundary spanners, but they, you know, they're part of organizations that had the best project due date performance, the best operations, the best security, the best compliance. And, and that all went into a book uh, called The Visual Handbook, which was about in 2004. And so where this, this journey has taken me is straight into the heart of the DevOps movement. And I'm so thrilled that I'll be, I'm working on this uh, project called yeah, the DevOps Cookbook right. Project, where um, four of our co-authors are presenting with me, and uh, the other uh, two co-authors are include John Allspaw and Jez Humble. And our goal is to really figure out, to capture and codify how do you make that good to great transformation you know, to go from you know great to awesome, right? Uh, and you know, do it in a way that you don't it doesn't require having John Alspa, you know, on site all the time. So, you know, for uh, just very briefly, for those of you um, maybe you probably saw the seminal Alspa Hammond uh, presentation, you know, that, I think that really kicked off the DevOps movement. Of course, uh, Patrick Dubal was the other sort, and just humble. You know, all around 2009, I uh, started talking about the same thing: the seminal 10 deploys a day uh, at Flickr. Um, and you know the the incredible imagery of like you know Spock as development who gets to sit on the bridge next to Captain Kirk while Scotty is stuck in the basement saying we can't go any faster, right? And Kirk always saying you know we must go faster, you know, uh, you know give us warp speed. And you know what I remember so well from this uh, for the guys, and I've watched this so many times is you know the way they do it is you know by having ops people who think like developers and developers who uh, think like operations people. And it's more than to get this torrid summer of love, right? But you get great outcomes. And I think one of the things that I found in the, the journey of studying high-performing organizations is that the, one of the universals is that the best get better. So John Jenkins uh, presented uh, last year at the Velocity Conference about, gave this stat, right? It's like 10 deploys a day uh, you know, was shocking and maybe even considered immoral in 2009. Like as of uh, last year, uh, Amazon got on the record saying they're not doing 10 deploys a day. They're doing one deploy every 11 seconds, right? So, uh, with a peak uh, rate of 1,000 deploys in an hour. So. You know, uh, you know, the best always get better. So, you know, I, the reason why this is an important problem to me is that every company, despite the business that they think they're in, is actually an IT company, right? 50% of all capital spend is technology related. 95% of all capital projects have an IT component, right? So that means it goes through the IT value stream, through dev, into operations. And so, um, uh, and you know, I think from an economic perspective, you know, what's at stake? You know, if we can just do our job better and manage the IT value stream better, I did a calculation with one of the other uh, DevOps Cookbook co-authors, and we said, you know what, if we just have the amount of IT waste associated with Dev and Ops, right, and could redeploy that in a way that we can get five times value, that's three trillion dollars of value that we can get per year, right? And so that's actually more than t the entire economic output of Germany. So just think about what that can do for not only standard of living and productivity, but you know, the world that my kids will inherit. So uh, the goal is, you know, how um, I don't, uh, you know, need to proselytize DevOps and the value of DevOps now to this crowd of all people. But the question is like, how do we do that, right? If you believe what Christopher Brown said, right? Okay, I got the rhetoric. How can I actually put that into practice? And so that's the goal behind the DevOps book of Cookbook project, which is currently in work and it's going to come out sometime next year. And you know, to be uh, working with these people is. Uh, one of those humbling moments of my life. Um, and by the way, there are some of these conference calls where I know I'm the dumbest person on the call. Um, but it, it does remind me uh, that one of my favorite sayings is, you're only as smart as the average of the top five people you hang out with. And so you know, every time I leave one of these phone calls, uh, you know, I know I'm getting a little bit smarter. So uh, let me, my role in this uh, uh, part, portion is to set up the principles of what would you leave you can derive all the DevOps patterns from show you the four parts or the four areas uh, where the patterns can be applied. And then my colleagues, we're going to each present on one of the four areas. Um, and then uh, we'll conclude. 
So the first way, uh, so we're calling the three ways, uh, both in this novel called When IT Fails, a business novel, and a DevOps cookbook. We're calling it the three ways, the three principles or even platitudes of which you can derive all the patterns from. So the first way is all about systems thinking, right? So as you go from dev to ops, it's the left to right flow, right? And so uh, why dev to ops? Um, so the platitudes or the principles really are understanding the flow of work, you know, as you go from the business to development to operations to the customer, right? And always seeking to increase flow, right? Uh, so if you look at Six Sigma, theory of constraints, all of this is uh, meant to sort of elevate flow. Uh, reducing batch sizes. Another principle is uh, never unconsciously pass defects downstream. Um, right? We never want to do things in a way that uh, makes work more difficult or create rework in a downstream work center. And we never want to locally optimize in a way that causes global degradation. Right? So in other words, it's not just about shipping features to dev. Right? We need to care about the entire end to end flow. Um, and then you know, achieving what Demi would call profound understanding system that spans you know, not just the technology of people, process, right? Uh, you know, how can you make a good business decision without understanding the technology aspects of it? So the first way is all about left to right as we go from dev to ops. The second way is all about the reciprocal, right? You know, how do you sort of get feedback from right to left? Right, and so the principles or platitudes behind this is understanding and responding to the needs of all customers, internal and external. So what the lean thinking people would say is that customers include any downstream step as well as the end customer. Um, and uh, what we want to do is, behind every process improvement, we want to shorten and amplify all feedback loops um, and stopping the line whenever necessary, right? So the Toyota Andon cord, right, would be a great example where they say that the sins of uh, letting a defect continue down the line is so great that it's actually better to stop the entire line. Um, and then we want to create quality at the source, right? So the best embodiment of this is like designing for manufacturing, where the engineers realize the end customer is actually manufacturing. How do we make a uh, design piece in a way where you can't have an error during assembly? Um, and then creating and embedding knowledge where we need it right now. How do we make sure that that manufacturing expertise lives with the engineers? How do we get opposite expertise you know, with developers? <laughs> and then the third way, um, so the first way was left to right. The second way is right to left. And the third way is what we're point calling, you know, uh, uh, tentatively, a culture of continual experimentation and learning. Right, and the goal is to foster culture that simultaneously rewards taking risks uh, and learning from failure, or as Mr. Allspot, Sensei Allspot would say, and learning from success and failure, and then understanding that repetition is a prerequisite to mastery. Right, so whether you're talking about sports training or special forces in the military or learning a musical instrument, right, habits, practice, everything requires practice. Practice creates habits, habits create mastery. Uh, and so why do you need this? You need a culture that allows you to take risks and go into the danger zone, but also have the skills that allow you to retreat out quickly when you've gone too far. So um, before I turn this over to Mr. Area One, uh, Mr. Patrick Dubois, um, let me just sort of cast for you the four areas uh, that we're sort of putting all these patterns into. The first area is all about extending uh, the flow from dev to ops, extending the continual delivery from, as you go from uh, dev to ops. So think just humble and continual delivery. Area two is reciprocal. Like, how do you get feedback from operations to developers? So, how do you harness your inner John Allspa? Um, third is how do you embed the development capabilities and knowledge into ops? So, in my mind, I think Aiden Cockcroft from Netflix. And then, how do you do reciprocal? How do you embed operations into development? So, yeah, that would be like in my mind, like Chris Reed. Um, so, we're going to share those in turn. So, I'll turn this over to uh, Sensei. Wow. Okay, I guess that's just the summary. Yes. Um, so, area one, getting dev into ops. So, um, the big goal is, in general, is that uh, when we have those teams fighting between each other, that we refocus them actually <coughs> on what the business wants. It's not something what the ops wants. They want to have servers or want to have software. No, it's what the business wants. I know it sounds trivial, but it's still the most important thing. On a practical level, like the first step I see people do is start a conversation. Like it's pragmatic. Uh, you, you, you're not gonna solve all the problems at once, but you wanna get that uh, conversation started. So how do you get it started? Um, by the way, I'm not gonna talk a lot of new things here, uh, but if you're already doing it, reflect for yourself if you're really doing it because often you think you're doing it. It's like when I tell my kids 
you know, have to brush their teeth. They will tell me, yes, I'm doing it, I do that. But in reality, they're not. So, so putting people together, face-to-face uh, -face meetings, it, step one is get the people that know some pain, that kind of have a conflict or whatever, get them together. Uh, don't do it like in your corner. It sounds trivial, again, but this is what you need. Um, also understand that there is other things that might be influencing that, like the management goals. Like I see so many times, like, hey, we're gonna do continuous delivery, there's a whole pipeline, but we have like the ops and the, the development teams, they have to listen to seven project managers. How can we align the goal? So it's not just about the devs and the ops collaborating and making their workflow. It's getting those people uh, goals from the management, whether they're not conflicting together. Uh, and the same with, is with HR policies. But if you pay out a bonus for people that they're delivering faster features or they're delivering uh, more uptime, um, that's going to create like a different way how they collaborate. So be aware that these things will have an influence when you start, and that's the one, or one thing you want to do. If you have a fight going on and you want to do that, reestablish the trust that people can work together. Don't wait until you get into the war room that you have to put them all together. Just do that continuously. Like Step one, get them together. <clears throat> Once you get the people in the room, they often have like a pretty good ID like, or their own vision on what's going wrong. So by getting them all into a room and saying, hey, we want to have this feature go into production, and you start mapping that process, you will get an inventory of things that are going wrong, things that can be improved, and so on. You can look at the bug reports or the backlog of things that aren't progressive, uh, progressing to see where your pain points, and you can relate that to that. So where is the real bottleneck? Is it in the tools, the processes, or the people? So don't blindly think the tools gonna do it. So continuous delivery, I'm not gonna go over, over it, but I guess the book goes a long way but think it of it extra with infrastructure as code and operations in mind. Uh, so version control, not only your software, but your server configs, uh, one repository, one step development test, and so on. So I hope you're already doing that. It's kind of trivial, but it's, it's part where it's going. It tends to be technology focused, uh, but once you start thinking like, can I extend my release immediately into production? That's changes your mind. It's like, hey, what if this software uh, is the only thing that takes you to the moon? Will you trust it? Like, it just changes your mind how you think of that. It's not just the tool of, I have a CI system we test and it creates an artifact. So, and then reducing whatever technical debt you have, like all the shortcuts you take, and kind of make that visible. The definition of done, we know like it's not like when you deliver the software, it's until it's delivered in production, used by uh, people. So it's that mind shift that becomes important. Like you get that going, get people talking, you get that process going with the tools and the mind shift of getting that too. Um, what's important, I found that to integrate the other roles in your company, it's just not your dev and ops, it's also your Q QA people or your change advisory board or your security people that needs to be integrated because they will see things moving, but they used to be there to control what gets out or be the buffer between the handover uh, with all the automation. Their life gonna change. I hope for the good. They're gonna focus on the less uh, standard changes, but they're gonna focus on what actually matters. Even with that principle, there's a lot of anti-patterns that I see happening. Like, number one, config management is DevOps, so if we solve that, we're doing DevOps. Obviously, the culture part and the process part is equally important. So think about it again, if you say we're doing DevOps or whatever we do, it's not there. Uh, so really, culture, um, so, yeah, John, he gets excited all the time that people keep forgetting the culture, but it is important. And what you really want to do is like, if you have a, a certain culture, you can stay that ahead of it by creating that new culture. Like, whatever pops up, it's kind of keep that culture evolving until you get it right. There's not one culture that fits everything. Anti-pattern two, like, you really at that. Somewhere in the corner, 
uh, there was like two people me like, let's let's do this cool tool and yeah we're collaborating we're having lunch but it's not gonna have the effect it's uh, it's not gonna happen um, so you want to integrate like into the process of the complete company not staying aside and obviously that doesn't work the other anti pattern is like the separate DevOps group I think it can work as a change agent in your company like have a new group have it spark and do it initiative. But I'm very skeptical if that stays a separate group and if it's not getting embedded in the rest of the organization. Uh, that's at least my vision to it. And another thing I, I keep getting is like, infrastructure's code, so the developers say, hey, we're the best coders, we've been doing that for a long time, but they feel like we're taking over production. The funny thing is they're relearning production. Like <laughs> they have to relearn about monitoring, about the backup, about all these problems. So it's not the fact that one person does all. It's like they they think like the other and so on. And they collaborate. So it's another anti-pattern I, I see happening. And yeah, okay, so it has a buzzword. If it if you can't show results, that's just gonna be very bad if you start doing that. So the um, final thing is just uh, an interesting experiment I saw. If you have like a people in the room and you say, if 80% of the people invest their time in something new or to make an improvement, and you they get a payoff uh, by 80% if more than people, 80% of the people do it, and nothing if they don't. Uh, if there's less than people invest, the investors will lose <coughs> money and the others have no problem. What's happening if you repeat that experiment is that initially, if you ask that question, and there's about 70% of the people who say, we're gonna work on it, then they're slowly gonna move to everybody cooperate. If you're doing it with 20% of the people investing their time, and the others saying, hey, it doesn't hurt if they don't succeed, and whatever, then they might, it's probably gonna be a shift by people saying, hey, nothing's gonna happen. So be wary that there's an inertia you have to overcome and you do that by results. But it's also important that you set the stage wide enough in the beginning of your company so your initiative doesn't die in your corner. So at the end, you will have like more robust technology. You have people who trust each other again with a shared process to the business goal. So that's my area. Thanks, Matt. Can you guys hear me okay? <coughs> no, no, no. All right. Is it on now? Yep. Okay, hey, there we go. All right. Good afternoon, Velocity London. Uh, first of all, thanks you all for showing up. This is an awesome, uh, awesome crowd. So in area one, uh, Patrick was talking about really defining the system, right? You now have an end-to-end -end system where it goes from an idea all the way through to a measurable customer result in production. So what do you do next, right? Now you define that that, uh, that playing field. Well, you gotta provide feedback and, uh, and visibility. Pretty uh, pretty obvious. But like all DevOps things, you gotta run this through the filter of why, right? What's, you know, why do you have all this feedback and visibility? And one of the key differentiators between uh, high-performing organizations and non-high-performing organizations, it's not the volume of the data they have, it's what they're actually doing with it. You know, what, why do they have this, this, this feedback and visibility? And fundamentally, the high performers understand that it's to align your organization's improvement efforts. The rest of it is just, it's just noise. So what do you actually mean by aligning your, your organization? How do you actually do that? How do you get everybody thinking towards the same vision and acting on, acting on that vision? Uh, there's two ways. One is really outside the scope of this talk. It's a, it's a management issue, just you know, clear goals and operating instructions. What are we trying to accomplish? Setting that vision of where we're trying to go to. The second is really uh, what I want to talk about is this notion of shared situational awareness, right? And I actually wrote down a uh, US Coast Guard definition of it because I thought it was so just uh, on the money. So situational awareness is the ability to identify, process, and comprehend the critical elements of information about what is happening to the team regards to the mission. Or more simply put, it's knowing what is going on around you, right? So that's, that's the vision that, that this feedback has to, uh, has to sell. So uh, you'll recognize our uh, fearless velocity leader, Mr. Allspaw there. Um, you know, he's much more of a handsome devil in, in, in real life, but let's not look at him. Let's look at what's going on behind him. This is a great example of you know, radiating situational awareness. There's a story behind the data that shows up on those, on those, uh, on those screens. 
So, you know, how do you actually go about creating? That's not going forward here. Okay, let's switch to the. Why we're stuck? Hmm. Sorry, guys. Jump into the, the old manual. So. Okay, that works. <laughs> All right, so uh, you know, create the situational awareness. There's really four types of data that you need to radiate throughout your organization. Uh, starting on the right there, infrastructure data, the bottom, business data, application data, and people and process data. You're probably saying, what the hell is that? But I will uh, cover that in a, uh, in a second, right? So step one, make all your infrastructure data visible, right? I mean, I think it just kind of goes out saying this day and age, grab everything, right? We're talking about the, you know, your network, disk IO, memory utilization, all that good stuff. But the critical thing is, uh, you know, the rest of organizations are not organization, organization are not systems administrators, right? So that data has to be presented in the context of the application. Um, you need to also standardize and extend that data collection and analysis to all of your environments. If someone's seeing something for the first time in production, they're not going to be able to help you. So instrument and capture and run the same analysis on your, you know, pre-production environments as you are running on your production environments. If not, for anything, just to get people used to the notion of seeing that data. Um, you also want to make sure that you're creating awareness of deviations from the norm, right? Um, you know, people may not be able to read, read the matrix and understand what, what you see, but they'll, they'll be, un, be able to understand deviations from the norm. You know, just, I put an example there of a, a statistical process control chart, really just to do that. If you show people what the norm is and they understand something's deviating, that start, starts the broader, uh, the broader conversations, right? So uh, um, step two here, right? Make the application data visible, right? So this is stuff that you probably already have a lot of uh, already. Uh, the key thing here is making sure that the developers take ownership of instrumenting their applications, right? It's it's the developer's job. They understand what the thing is that they that they wrote. It's part of the old ownership um, idea, and uh, but make sure anyone can view that data, extend that data, remix and use it as they as they want. Um, you see high performers, you know, enabling this self-service metric creation. It shouldn't feel like a schema change to get a new metric uh, tracked. It should be a single line of code. There's libraries out there out there to do this. Plenty of prior art on that one. Also, you know, developers have to increase the signal, and decrease the noise, right? You got to stop dumping 500 lines of, of messages into uh, into the logs and expecting anybody to understand what that what that means. So, uh, third thing, break out the business data out of their silos. You've got all this data. I'm sure it's probably some, you know, if not your CFO, your marketing folks look at this stuff. Sales, signups, churn, clickstream, everything. It's there. Break it out. Uh, let let everyone uh, use it and um, uh, match it to their own uh, their own metrics. Um, a key thing here is this is kind of one that a lot of people fail on is that you know people understand their activity what they're doing and they understand this goal the business is talking about. You know Amazon talks about their one metric that matters their order rate right. Well the key thing is not just saying we got one metric that matters their order rate. The key thing is explaining to everybody and their day-to-day -day job, how their activity tracks to a metric that they're able to follow that then builds a chain all the way through to that one metric that, that matters. So if you aren't building that chain, um, you're really not accomplishing the uh, mess by showing that data. And this is the one that uh, people are like, what the, the hell is people in process data? So you know, we've got lots of data about our things, about our systems, but what about what's going on in the most important part of organization, our people, right? The, 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 the work, the flow of activity that's going on. We're talking about DevOps is solving these, these problems, uh, these bottlenecks between different parts of our organization and increasing flow and quality. We need to actually make that visible, right? And uh, you know, here we're not really focusing on efficiency. We're not tracking time or individual activity. We're tracking the effectiveness of the organization, right? So you know, two simple ways to get this started. One, you know, visualize the flow across the life cycle. If you're if you're in the uh, you know continuous delivery camp already, um, you can use uh, a pipeline visualization tool. Uh, there's plugins for lots of uh, CI servers and build tools that do that. Uh, Kanban's another great way. Even if you aren't using Kanban at, as a way to manage the organization, to use that as a visualization tool, get everybody understanding what the flow is across the organization. And the other part of this, a really easy way to start is whatever your change tools are, instrument them to actually record activity and change in your organization. I mean, all problems start with a change, even if the change was to introduce the thing that now is, uh, is broken in your organization. So capture that data and overlay it on top of all the other graphs. Um, you know, an interesting story of that is um, you've seen folks who they, they overlay their change data over the number of posts to their user forms, right? 
great way of just saying, hey, look at that. Um, I see a spike in my, in my, in my user form traffic. Um, a bunch of change just, changes just happened. We probably screwed something up or just made somebody unhappy with the change. We see no change, maybe everything's, uh, everything's good. So really, two things you can do, visualize flow and uh, capture that change data and overlay it over, over everything. Really, this is about you know, driving continuous improvement. Real quick to show you what, what Allspot was looking at behind there. <coughs> Examples doing just that. You got your you know, check-in information, you've got your, your pipeline visualization, um, you've got all your application and infrastructure metrics, and you have uh, your change data overlaid over there. And it's, you know, it's a little bit of fun eye candy seeing where your latest transaction came from in the, uh, in the world. So now you're ready for Allspot. Right, so right, now you're ready for uh, step three. All right, four minutes. Okay. Uh, thanks. All right. So uh, area one, forward. Area two, feedback into the op uh, organization. Area three is embedding development into operations. So you know, harnessing your inner Dubois or uh, Adrian Cockcroft. So you know. Uh, by the way, as a former developer, I feel okay putting this uh, picture. When I think about developers, I think about like uh, the joke: uh, "Show me a developer who's not uh, causing an outage. I'll show you one on vacation." Right, uh, don't want to do, right? So kind of the goals of uh, this particular part are we want to shorten those feedback loops and amplify them. We want to create the knowledge and capabilities where we need it and making sure that development is actually um, you know, doing their work with the entire flow in mind. And I think one of the, my favorite quotes, again, from Velocity, uh, was uh, from last year. He, uh, he was the founder of a company called Browser Mob, and he said, we found that when we fixed, we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever. <laughs> and I think it's a marvelous quote and really does show, if you take a look at um, so much of what Tom Lomicelli talks about at Google, uh, Patrick Duvall or Adrian Cockroft at Netflix, I mean, I think these are sort of the values uh, that they're putting into practice into the uh, ops and dev organization. I think one of the best codification I've seen of this uh, came from a talk that uh, Lomicelli has been doing around what the Google's SRE, the Systems Reliability Engineering Practice, has been at Google. And uh, they have a specific uh, phrase about like, they require that development initially maintain their own service. In other words, if they're gonna take resources from the SRE pool, they must uh, be able to show that they manage their own applications for six months, right? And they have something called the HRR, the Handoff Readiness Review, right? And so here's what the Handoff Readiness Review looks like. You know, they you have to have, you know, show evidence of like pager, monitoring, system architecture review, release process, I love this one, production hygiene. You know, show that, you know, uh, you're not doing this, right? Then you don't have a huge amount of technical debt in the organization, right? Because then we call it technical debt because debt compounds. So this eventually turns into this, right? Uh, imagine an outage, the cabling error somewhere between, you know, on rack three, right? That's not good. So when that happens, right, that there's actually a clause, um, you know, that says, all right, you can draw from the SRE pool, but if, you, if it's sufficiently fragile, and it's uh, always breaking, then something like this happens. It gets handed back to developers. You're now ineligible to uh, have SREs um, uh, manage your, uh, the, the application. So uh, there's three, um, I think that the continuation of that is that you want in development integrated into the IT, IT operations escalation processes, uh, you know, so like level three or level four, right? You want that feedback going back to development as opposed to being locked in the ticketing system. You want, on the other hand, you also want development cross-training IT operations staff. You want that master, the tribal knowledge living in IT operations. And you want to create uh, projects where development is helping improve the environment. So they're not working on just improvement of the code, but they're using the skills to improve the environment as well. And, um, and so I think one of the best examples I've seen of this in person is this is a guy named Eric Passmore. He was the CTO of AOL. Uh, I started working with him when I was the SVP of Global Engineering. And he used to be that Eric Passmore to the IT ops guys, that person who always squashed operations. But when he saw the impact the operations had on feature flow, right, he became, oh, that Eric Passmore. He became one of the best champions for IT operations and, and changed everything, deploying processes, uh, et cetera. So that is area three, uh, area four. Hello. Yep. So my name is John Willis. This is a miracle to get four guys to do this in 40 minutes. So uh, Loop on Twitter, Area 4. Um, so what, why, you know, why do we talk about this? We use the dev versus ops, and we, we're really talking about alignment, right? We're talking about um, trying to get overall organization alignment. We use dev and ops as the character to do that, right? So a lot of what we do, like people talk, hear me talk about culture all the time. I just think culture is just the biggest part of what we do. So it's about, what you've heard from all the other gentlemen today is about behavior hacks, right? We're trying to change behavior in an organization. So this area four, one of the areas that 
I'm gonna talk about is changing the behavior, like moving behavior or hacks that will take development to think more like operations, right? So there are some examples of what Lean will give us, like error proofing, pokey yoke, um, the five whys, those type of things. I'm gonna focus for the next like seven or eight minutes on what we call the kind of embedded ops into dev, um, or sometimes they call it the homeless model, right? <laughs> you know, but um, so, but the, the thing is, is what, what we've seen uh, patterns of people say to me, well, John, I love this whole story about DevOps, but how, you know, how do I do it? I'm a big, large, monolithic applicant organization. So one of the hacks that we see a lot is this idea of taking an ops person and actually moving their office into the development organization, right? Becoming part of that team. Um, so, and, and sometimes it's like a short period, sometimes up to a year. Um, and so why do we do this? Um, if you saw Chris Brown's and we think about the, the first way of system thinking, <laughs> seeing end to end, global optimization, not thinking locally, Right, we're trying to hack that behavior, right? Sharing the pain, the empathy, right? Make the people in dev feel the pain of ops, right? The early, um, the early area was make ops feel the pain of dev, right? Put developers, I think there was reference to putting pagers and giving developers pagers, right? That's a make the pain, right? We're breaking things down, right? Uh, create a common cultural understanding. I love the Andon Accord. How many people know what the Andon Accord came from? Right? So it's Toyota Production Systems, actually a rope that any line person on the line, at any time when they felt there was a defect or some quality issue, anybody, the lowest of the low, nobody was low at Toyota Production Systems, they pull the line and it stops. And everybody's responsibility to fix it before the line starts. Well, this is a form of doing that. You're putting an ops person in debt, like, whoa, whoa, tea time, stop. We're not going to do that because that's going to hurt us down, down the line, right? Um, educating ops. Flatten, flattening the knowledge chain, right? Um, uh, creating patterns of thought tolerance. How many people saw John's presentation the other day? Right, uh, it, it was awesome, right? John Osparts, right? The, with the situational errors, all that stuff, the way John thinks, right? How do we get that in the dev organization? How do we get them to think fault tolerant, right? I'm not saying they don't, but in some organizations they don't, <laughs> right? So, um, and then this is another form of uh, technical debt, right? It, it is, there's ways to handle, particularly operations technical debt, Right? But there are ways to handle it. This is one way. I'm paying off some technical debt. I'm taking someone out. They're no longer supporting out. They're in debt. Um, so what are some of the models of engagement for this? Right? So the examples that we've seen. Um, one is the simple, what we call one-off. Right? And that is that you have a, a situation where a large organization, you take somebody and you put them in debt, like I described. Um, more mature levels are kind of cross-functional teams, usually greenfield projects. I'm starting a new project. Sometimes you hear it called a DevOps team. I don't really like that, but it, it, it makes sense. I take an engineer, a security, I take an architect, and I build this new greenfield as this cross-functional team. Higher level maturities that we've seen are organizations that actually have pools of resources that are available to embed. A Linux team, and even higher than that, specialized teams. The, a DBA team, imagine that. You're, you've got this really down and going that you can actually pull these embedded resources for particular forms of technical debt. And then, uh, you, know, I, uh, you know, I hate the word no ops for a lot of reasons, right? And I won't get into that now, but, but what I must mention is Netflix in the US has a model of this embedded, they call it no ops. What it means, what it really means is it's just one dev organization with ops in it. It's just another form of, of this embedded model. Um, so Gene talked about design for uh, manufacturing, DFM, right? Um, so what we're really saying here is design for operations. Right? If, again, if you listen to Chris's, Chris Brown's brilliant uh, keynote, right? Um, it is about us being scientists, right? Whether we're science, whether we got EEs or not, it doesn't matter. All right, so what, what do we do, right? We're going to improve things, continuously improve. And we're going to put an ops person over there so that we start thinking about the naming standards for fig files the directory structures, right? The things that the dev, yeah, yeah, who cares? Well, the ops care, right? How do you instrument things, the important things to instrument? What operational people need to know at three in the morning that might, might make sense or not make sense? Logging, dare that. You actually put logs in a format that ops can actually use with Logstash or, God forbid, Splunk, if, you, if you're rich, <laughs> rich and famous, all right? Um, improve environment, right? Improve at another level, like, Configuration management, chef, puppet, see invention, right? So a lot of companies will go ahead and say, oh, you know, we need that. I used to work for Opsco, right? And you go and then like, yeah, I know we need to do that, but 
but you know, if I let the ops guys do it, it's not going to solve the problem. If I, the dev guys are never going to do it, right? They're too busy, right? So this is another form. Is uh, there's a guy on uh, Dan Nimick out of Atlanta, Silipop. His job was to go on ops and be the person who implemented Chef for a year in dev. Stayed out of dev's way. Brilliant, right? So, um, and then um, another form is uh, building immune systems. Eric Reese's uh, lean startup, building immune system. Putting that mindset of how you have to do it pre-deployed. What do you have to do? Um, so what, so we've been, we've been trying to identify poster childs for each one of these sections, right? John Osbar, um, Area 2, um, Adrian Krokoff, uh, Area 3. Um, and Chris Reed, who's a local bloke, by the way, at DRW, he is our poster child. C. Reed, follow him. He's at DRW, he's here, he hangs out a lot of things. In fact, he has the distinguished honor of Jez Hummel saying he was his mentor. That's a pretty cool thing, That's right? Um, um, so, um, and again, what Gene like, drove this into me. Working with Gene is awesome, that could be another 40 minutes, but like, we need to make sure that we understand that this is, what we're trying to do is institutionalize the operations knowledge. We're building reusable IT operations. How about that, right? So, um, and we're gonna do this in the design, the architecture, the controls, the monitoring, and the deployment. Like, have you ever seen that picture? It's one of my favorite pictures. It's the Vatican. It's totally awesome. Um, and um, break things early and often. Who has heard of Chaos Monkey? Ah, everybody. So this is not new, right? But here's the thing, right? If developers wear pagers, Chaos Monkey, well, here's the thing. You don't choose Chaos Monkey, Chaos Monkey chooses you, right? And so, <laughs> so, right? so the thing is, is you're going to basically design for failure, particularly if you're going to wear a pager and not you're a developer. Right? And for those who don't know, it's something that actually goes around and randomly kills processes. Talk about being bulletproof in the way you think. Right? Awesome. Outcomes, improved operational readiness, deployment success, decreased cycle time, awesome stuff. Quickly, one minute I got uh, anti-patterns. Be very careful. If you say, well, Don, this is great. This is a social experiment. Uh, we are trying to change behavior. Um, Couple of two things you must understand about that. The motivation of the person that, you, that raises hand and says, oh, I'd love to go over there in debt for, for um, some time. Right? Make sure that they're not a hero worship. They're not trying to do it for hero. They're the kind of person that gets know the credit and builds everything. One last point is make sure the person who goes into uh, dev from ops maintains those tribal relationships with the original team. Because what will happen, they might just become the dev and start thinking that way, right? So, yes, <laughs> important. Anyway, I'm done. Um, well, then, putting together this presentation is very challenging because we're not done yet. And so, as John uh, yeah. says, showing the sausage is actually uh, very difficult. Anyway, so these are what we believe are some patterns. Uh, a broad overview of uh, what we think are the patterns that put together create the transformative steps so you can become, uh, you know, replicate the good to great transformation that we're seeing so often. Um, so why, you know, just so you know, why do I think this is important? One is the economic value, right? Three trillion dollar values out there per year, right? I mean, uh, you know, I think that's important. But I, for me personally, you know, I think there's a terrible downward spiral that occurs when dev and ops don't work together. And then, you know, throw in product managers, throw in security, right? It gets even worse, right? And I think uh, when you uh, are trapped in a system where you feel like failure is preordained, you know, that uh, you are powerless to stop it, I think that has a tremendous, awful cost to us as human beings, right? And so uh, this is a type of problem that we take home to our families, right? Uh, and I think that there's, there's no more horrible thing that we can do to other people. So, you know, I think that is uh, a problem we're solving. Uh, so there are two books that we're working on at IT Revolution Press. One is called When IT Fails, A Business Novel, and then the second one is a prescriptive companion guide, uh, the DevOps Cookbook. And so uh, our goal is to, is to positively influence the lives of a million IT workers in the next five years. And so we've shared with you what well, we can share in 40 minutes, uh, but if you're interested in the top 10 things that uh, you need to know about DevOps, the white paper I wrote, uh, the resources that um, uh, we're writing as you go in the creation of the book, um, or updates on the book, just go ahead and pick up your phone and text uh, your email address and the number 75271 to that phone number, or you can go to this URL uh, and you'll instantly get this presentation. Uh, you'll get the <laughs> time's up, and you'll get the presentation, and uh, you'll also be added to the mailing list to uh, keep you posted on uh, the two books. So, One Anti Fails is coming out uh, January 15th, and Demo Cookbook coming in sometime first half of next year, if all goes well. Thank you.